History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No, it's deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We're digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. I'm Phil. And I'm Matt. We're not historians. We're just two guys who enjoy a great story and plenty of laughs. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is The Wronged Heroine of DNA. So I wanted to start today's episode, since this is another scholarly episode for us, after Laura Bossi a couple weeks or a couple months back, uh, by talking about our high school and college coursework. Um, and I wanted to start the conversation by asking you, what were your least favorite high school or college courses or any subjects that gave you particular trouble? can't say band can i no i don't feel like band gave you actual trouble <laughs> it might have been no it, i'm just kidding it was more like dealing with personalities right. trouble yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh i don't know i guess probably honestly the class that i struggled the most with was like math and i know that's like weird because i was actually good at math and like good at understanding the concepts of it it was more just the fact that like i didn't really put in a ton of effort to learn it thoroughly on my own if that makes sense so like i don't know i i was definitely like good at math it was just more that you know (laughs) i maybe didn't always do the required homework because it wasn't really required and it took me a little bit longer to like quickly grasp the concepts and it was more my own fault versus how the class was taught or it being particularly difficult yeah I agree with that. I mean, one of my worst subjects was math. And I think given my experience, like I could have been very good at math. I think I understood, like you said, I understood the concepts. And once I did, I was, I was fine. But when it came to practicing things outside of the classroom, I was not so motivated. And in fact, me and my (laughs) sister, we used to make fun of my dad because he would talk about doing the extra problems in his math book for for not fun, but for practice. And we used to make fun of him for sleeping with his math book. That's what we used to say, like that he slept with his math book <laughs> because obviously that sounds like you're yeah, me and my sister never did the extra problems. It was like the bare minimum, whatever we needed to do to get the homework done that was assigned. And I will be <laughs> honest, like, my dad was partially right in that I struggled with math in high school and college because in middle school, I wasn't willing to put any extra work to truly understand the concepts, which at that time were was algebra and later on in geometry and chemistry and physics and everything else like algebra was <laughs> pretty much the baseline foundational knowledge and I couldn't do it well. I could do it enough to pass classes but i couldn't do it well enough to push the envelope or you know reach the potential that i think i could have so math is definitely one of those that's up there for me too yeah i would say it it wasn't even so much necessarily that it was particularly difficult subject matter it was just once you understood the concepts it all made sense to me it was just a matter of like putting in the time and effort to understand the concepts and i guess i'm thinking more about like high school because that's kind of where you do your like general education subject matter if that makes sense like other other courses seem to be a lot more just memorizing like i mean we're doing a history podcast and when you talk about learning history you're kind of just memorizing a lot of right (laughs) dates and names and yeah things that happened but i guess probably what sticks with you in that sense is just understanding maybe the the culture or maybe even the attitudes of the people in those times and just the way that those times were and i think even as we're going through doing these episodes like when you're presenting a topic i generally don't know that much about the actual person or the actual story so all i can really draw from it to have comments on it is just 
my understanding of what the world was like at that time or in that yeah region of the world <laughs> so there's definitely some that are you know i feel like i understand more of what you're talking about going into it versus one that is something i have no background in at sure. all i mean yeah i i agree with that i think one of our like i mean i don't know if this is true for you but for me especially having had a negative experience with math in middle school led to a deficiency in high school and in college. And I find that like the reason I think that so strongly is that I've gone back on like online platforms like Khan Academy to try to relearn math. And I find myself going all the way back to like basic algebra to, to really start to build a foundation mm -hmm. because you know, geometry and I'm sure Jess is going to listen to this and be like, you <laughs> dum-dums. <laughs> but I mean, even geometry and especially calculus, like you have to know basic algebra. And I know very, very basic algebra, but like the more complex parts of it start to, I don't know, supersede my understanding. So I have to like go back and look at things instead of just knowing them by heart. I think it's funny that you bring up Jess because <laughs> her name was in my mind at the start of this when we were talking about math because yeah. Jess has a lot to do with me passing math classes in middle school even. And for listeners who don't know who Jess is, she's a longtime friend of ours that we went to school with pretty much through most of grade school and into high school. Uh, but yeah, Jess was like my homework buddy in homeroom yeah. in middle school. <laughs> where if I didn't do the assignment, I pretty much just copied her answers. Uh, but again, like I, I uh, not to, I don't know, sound like a humble brag here, but I, I was definitely one of those students that like never really had to study for things throughout right. grade school and into high school. So even getting into college where, you know, coursework is generally different, it's not just basic concepts anymore. Having to then actually study and learn on your own and teach yourself some different concepts was kind of a shock to me. Like it, I had to learn in a completely different right. way than what I'd been doing for 12 years. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I understand that what you mean by having to relearn things in a way that like you've never really had to approach them before. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, the reason I wanted to bring that up too was because my first question to you was what, what was your least favorite subject? And math is up there for me, but I had a particularly difficult time in high school chemistry. And I don't want to use this as an excuse or anything, but like I was out sick for two weeks, fairly close to the beginning of the year. And I missed 10 classes of, you know, basic chemistry. And I never really caught up. I tried. I didn't. I mean, I, I was I was attempting to catch up. But once I had missed that much coursework, it was very difficult to understand the later concepts. And that's kind of how I feel about math, too, where if you don't do a thorough job early on, later things, even if you understand them, are still hard to execute because you don't know the basics. And that's how I felt in high school chemistry, where I missed enough at the beginning of the semester that nothing made sense after that. And I was kind of swimming in this dark ocean for the rest of the year. Um, <laughs> and that so I would even that was that two weeks you spent in an iron lung, right? Yes, I was on an iron lung. That's exactly what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I yeah, I didn't I didn't understand things. And at the time, like my next question is going to be about teachers and professors, but the teacher didn't, not that he, he should have been expected to necessarily, but he didn't really have much empathy for me. He was mostly just like, you missed it. You <laughs> suck. You don't get it. Here's your D leave. And so I, I mean, it chemistry, high school chemistry was the first class that I received very, very poor grades in and like barely passed by the skin of my teeth just because of <laughs> missing the basics. But the reason I bring that up is because our topic today was a chemist and worked heavily in the field of chemistry. But before we get to her life, as I already spoiled a bit, I wanted to also ask just for a fun conversation if you had any 
teachers or professors that either made learning more difficult for you or who you think could have done a better job conducting their classes. I, I understand. Like, I mean, <laughs> I think a lot of people are very harsh on teachers and professors, and I understand that everybody has their own style of communication, but sometimes, especially researchers who are teaching on the side instead of teachers that happen to research. Yeah, I mean... There's not really anyone that sticks out to me from grade school or high school. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we're really in a position where we want to criticize public school teachers <laughs> <laughs> on our podcast. But I will say that generally my teachers at um, our high school were pretty good. Like I don't really remember anyone that was necessarily like a bad teacher or made concepts difficult. Yeah. Um, at least not intentionally, <laughs> I guess. I, I really only think I have one professor that stood out to me even from college who... I don't want to say that she was a bad professor and the class was sociology. So it had nothing to do with my degree. It was a required elective that I took, I think in my second to last semester because it was required for graduation yeah. and it was a entry or what not entry level, a uh, general education level. Is that the right yeah. term? Yeah. A, a general level introductory <laughs> an introductory level course but it was one of those just big lecture halls that the teacher required you to buy the book that she wrote and you know because I didn't care about the class really I didn't go buy it and then we're sitting in the class and I'm there every day I take the test and I get the first test and it's literally only half of the material is stuff that was actually covered in the class yeah. which was a shock to me because I was there at every single class and I paid attention and I was like, why is there stuff on here that I've never heard of before? And then I learned that she expected us to buy her book because she only taught half of her book. And the other half we were to read on our own, teach to ourselves, and it would be on the test. Which, like, I understand if you want to say that your policy is to teach students to think for themselves and to understand material for right. themselves. But also, if I'm paying to take a class taught by you, <laughs> that has nothing to do with my degree, but I'm required to take it, I kind of expect you to teach the material that is going to affect my grade. Like I had a very, not a 4.0, but a very good GPA in college. Right. And this one elective that had nothing to do with my degree could have damaged that because the teacher was only teaching half the material. Right. Yeah, I can combine that. Mine are both, both, I think, from high school. The one would have been the chemistry teacher that like... <laughs> He was very unsympathetic about my lack of understanding of the foundations. And I'll be honest, to give him credit, like I at that time could have could have cared less if he was sympathetic. Like I was just like, please get me out of here. I don't care what my grade is. Like I just want to be <laughs> out of this course. But the other the other one that sticks out was also a high school teacher and it was a history teacher, which was a subject that I was usually good at. But he actually said on syllabus so. day, he was a, he was a, on syllabus day, the first day of the class, he was like, you know, if you have something fun to do, if you have a concert or like concert tickets or plans with friends and there's a test the next day, go out, go to the, con he literally said this on the first day of the class, go out, <laughs> go to the concert, go, go out to the bar, like whatever. I mean, we were sophomores, so I don't know if he said go out to the bar, but he basically implied that <laughs> probably not <laughs> if there was a if there was a test the next day and we had something fun going on that we should blow off the test. That's basically his message. And his reasoning, he was like, nobody cares about history. This is just a high school course. Do whatever you want. <laughs> and <laughs> people did. And like we had some I mean, if I I'm not going to mention names, but I'm sure you'd know them if I said them. But there were some class clowns in my class that took advantage of that full full circle. And the entire semester was just a joke because of that that uh, start in terms of atmosphere and attitude. You're going to have to tell me what teacher this oh, is when we're done recording here. I can't even think of who it I is. don't remember his name, actually, but I'll tell you the class clown that I'm thinking of because it's a very specific person that I know you'll know. <laughs> But I don't know, I think a good middle ground between taking your subject seriously and also understanding that the people you're talking to aren't 
on your level and might need some coaxing or not coaxing necessarily, but some guidance. Guidance, I think is the word I want to use, is appropriate for somebody who's going to be teaching courses. I think that maybe as part of the value in listening to a a history podcast like this, though, mm-hmm. not that you and I are teachers or in any way qualified to be teachers, but we are kind of, well, number one, our listeners are making the initiative to seek out a podcast where they can right. learn more information about something that they don't already know. Yeah. But we are also on the same level as them in that we're pretty open about the fact that we are not experts in our subject matter. <laughs> like we're, right. we're not historians. We haven't researched this extensively. Like we pretty much just read a bunch of articles about an interesting topic and then sit down here and read back what we what we learn yeah so it's not like we're trying to quote unquote teach a super dense matter to people and expect them to understand these concepts we are trying to simplify things in a way that we understand them and since i think that we're at least educated and able to comprehend some concepts of history that our listeners are kind of on the same level and that's why they listen to us right hopefully (laughs) So with this start, I want to jump into our topic for today, which is Rosalind Franklin, who was a chemist in the mid 20th century, who did a lot of work in the field of chemistry and discovered a lot of things about DNA specifically that we will discuss later. But we'll start with her early life just to get into her, her story. So Franklin was born on the 25th of July, 1920 in Notting Hill, London, to Ellis Arthur Franklin and Muriel Francis Whaley. She was the eldest daughter and second child in her family of five children. Her older brother David, younger brothers Colin and Roland, and younger sister Jennifer. Her father Ellis was a politically liberal merchant banker in London, who taught at the city's working men's college. Her paternal great-uncle, Herbert Samuel, was the Home Secretary in 1916 and was the first practicing Jewish man to serve in the British cabinet. Her aunt, Helen Franklin, was married to Norman de Matos Bentwich, who was the Attorney General in the British Mandate of Palestine. Helen was active in the trade union organization and the women's suffrage movement. These connections made her family both affluent and influential in London at this time. Rosalind's parents helped settle Jewish refugees from Europe who had escaped the Nazis, and they took in two Jewish children to their home during the war. Oh, wow. I I guess I didn't even realize that people took in Jewish refugees mm-hmm. in Europe at the time. Yeah. But you mentioned her dad being politically liberal and basically like her family's involvement with trade unions, women's suffrage, housing refugees. It does seem to be similar to how we view liberal practices today do you know like were politics or at least political ideology any different then than now or is it still kind of along the same lines that's a good question um i think they were different than they are now but not as different as you might imagine i think the main difference now is that things are very you know on the spectrum they're very far end like i think a lot of people are further right or further left than they might have been at this time but overall you know when you look at this time in great britain or in even in the united states a lot of the problems weren't different they they just were coming from different causes or different countries but you know industrialization and capitalism and globalization was still a thing then it was just slower than it is these days Mm -hmm. but a lot of the i mean in my reading at least a lot of the central issues were fairly similar you know you had people coming into westernized countries that had a better quality of living from countries that had a lower quality one so that's not something that i think is all that different from what we're used to today Mm -hmm. you had the countries at the time, the major players, I think, were a bit different. You know, at this time, it was more like Germany, Britain, France, you know, the U.S. to some extent. But I feel like now it's maybe China, the United States, Japan. I don't I mean, I, I'm I'm not in a position at this point to say who the major players on the world stage are. But <laughs> I think the players were different, but the concepts and the challenges weren't all that different in, in what I read. So 
to return to your question, being politically liberal, I think at that time probably meant being less liberal than it is today. He was probably today. I think he would have been a a left leaning moderate, but I don't know that it was different enough to change the side of the fence that he was sitting on, if that makes any sense. Right. But he certainly, I mean, he, I think he certainly showed a, a support for female empowerment in his family and the kind of base ideology that one should care about people other than the citizens of one's own country, uh, based on what I read about him, which even today I think would be, would, would solidly place him in the quote unquote liberal camp. In any case, it's cool to see that he's, you know, taking in refugees rather than just posting on Facebook that someone should take in refugees. Right. <laughs> Doing more than the <laughs> average American would today. <laughs> but back to Rosalind. From an early age, she showed an exceptional aptitude for scholarly pursuits. At age six, she joined her brother Roland at Norland Place School, a private school in West London. At this time, her Aunt Helen described Rosalind as, quote, alarmingly clever. She spends all her time doing arithmetic for pleasure and invariably gets her sums right, end quote. And this is part of the reason why I wanted to bring up my dad and the joke about him sleeping with his math book, because <laughs> I thought of that when I read that she spends all her time doing arithmetic for pleasure. <laughs> she sounds like Hermione from Harry Potter. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, she probably was kind of. In, in that vein, in terms of her personality. At age nine, she entered Lindor's School for Young Ladies, which was a boarding school in Sussex. Two years later, at 11 years old, Rosalind went to St. Paul's Girls School in Hammersmith, West London, which is one of the few girls' schools that taught physics and chemistry. While at St. Paul's, she excelled at science, Latin, and sports, she showed an early interest in cricket and hockey. She also became fluent in German and in French. Which, side note, like, every time I read about people from this era, or, or before it especially, I'm, like, mind blown. I understand they didn't have, like, time-wasting things like Instagram and Facebook and Netflix and... But, like... Less time on TikTok, more time studying but language. Re for real, like... Imagine somebody today, imagine you just walked into a bar and started a conversation with somebody and they were good at science, like scientists that also were fairly fluent in Latin, played two different sports and also were fluent in German and French. Like, I'd be impressed. Well, <laughs> keep in mind, though, like her, her family, at least you did the research, seems to have some money. She's educated. This wouldn't have been typical of the average english family at the time i mean that that is a fair point they're clearly in a better position for these scholarly pursuits than most people but still i mean nonetheless uh a decent resume at age 11 <laughs> right in 1938 rosalind graduated with distinctions and received a scholarship for 30 pounds per year however her father asked her to give the scholarship to a deserving refugee student do you think she didn't deserve it? I don't think so. I think, I mean, he just understood, I think, that they had the money to send her to college. And for her to have a scholarship to pay for college. I, again, this is a very, like, economically liberal stance, I suppose. But, like, I think he, <laughs> he saw it as, we can pay for your college. Give that scholarship to somebody who can't. Yeah. So this isn't some kind of, you know sexist thing where he doesn't think his female daughter needs to continue her education um, it's actually like a a good thing where he's trying to offer education to someone else who might not be able to afford it based on what i read i would say the prior yes i don't know for a fact that it wasn't that he was like you're a woman you don't need to get educated but given his political leanings and everything i read and the phrasing i would i would lean pretty hard into the viewpoint that he thought the money should go towards somebody more deserving of it and more needing of it than the viewpoint that he didn't think she should be educated. Right. Well, that's good. 
Nonetheless, Franklin ended up going to Newnham College, Cambridge, in 1938. There, she studied chemistry and in 1941 was awarded second-class honors on her final exams, a distinction which was accepted as qualifications for a bachelor's degree. Franklin received her Bachelor of Arts in 1941 and was awarded a scholarship for a further year of research and a research grant from the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research. She spent that year in the laboratory of R.G.W. Norrish, a noted pioneer in photochemistry. In 1942, with the war still on, she had to decide whether to be drafted for more traditional war work or pursue a PhD-oriented research job in a field relevant to wartime needs. So no matter what, she had to help the war effort. There weren't, like, non-war-related options. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, yes. I think at the time, so much focus was given to war effort that almost the entire British economy, in in fact, most of the major... Western countries' economy, including France and the United States, were dedicated to pushing for this war effort. So I imagine that she had... Right, that's just a product of the time right, period. Right, I imagine that she didn't have a lot of choice there. Nonetheless, she chose the latter and began work with the recently organized British Coal Utilization Research Association, which is abbreviated as BCURA, that summer. For the next four years, Franklin worked to elucidate the microstructures of various coal and carbons and explain why some were more permeable by water, gases, or solvents, and how heating and carbonization affected permeability. Now I'm going to take this moment, since that sentence and that paragraph was as it was, to let our listeners know, as I stated, that chemistry was not my forte. It still (laughs) is not my forte. Can you... (laughs) Can you at least define elucidate? I'm going to be honest. I don't know the exact definition of it, but <laughs> I, I, be- I believe it means to expand upon and to explain. Sure, I'll take it. Sounds good I'm, to me. I'm fairly certain that's what it means. And now I'm <laughs> going to find out to make something clear. So I feel like I was spot on. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> My forte was English. <laughs> If I should know anything, it should be vocabulary. And your degree was in psychology. That was a convenience, not not by intention. (laughs) In this original work, she found that the pores in coal have fine constrictions at the molecular level, which increase with heating and vary according to carbon content of the coal. These act as, quote, molecular sieves, unquote, successively blocking penetration of substances according to molecular size. So the idea here is, I I guess for me in my head, like coal, which is what she's studying, is similar to, on a chemical level, similar to a sponge, where bigger holes would let in larger molecules and smaller ones would let in smaller molecules. And these Mm. change based on the temperature of the sponge, or in this case, the coal. This is the very basic... um, (laughs) conceptualization I have for her her research. (laughs) Franklin was the first to identify and measure these microstructures, and this fundamental work made it possible to classify coals and predict their performance to a high degree of accuracy. Her work at BCURA yielded a doctoral thesis. She received her PhD from Cambridge in 1945, and it yielded five scientific papers, which she published. So to sum this up, she did specific work on the microscopic pores and holes in coal and how those responded to heat. And at the time, I mean, this was a big deal. This was like today finding differences in the chemical compounds of gas. You know, coal was a major component of fuel at this time. And she figured out how to measure and understand the differences in different types of coal so that they could be used more so that they could be used more efficiently as fuel. It's also worth noting before I move on to the next point that some of her research in the porousness of coal led to developments in personal protective equipment uh, such as gas masks which were very important during this wartime period. So her work 
though it seems a bit, I don't know, boring and and very specific. <laughs> and this is something I find often with people I know that study chemistry or just chem concepts within chemistry. Her work had much more application than it seems upon reading it. So this is kind of how she begins her scientific research scholarly career. And before we get to the more poignant and important influential parts of her career, we're going to take a short break and we will be right back. So our listeners are pretty used to hearing us talk about what we're drinking on the on the episodes that we record. And usually it's beer, wine, or some sort of spirit, sometimes that has to do with the B-sider of the day. But today I'm just drinking a cup of coffee. And to be honest with you, Phil, it's the single worst cup of coffee I think I've made for myself <laughs> in several years. Oh no, is it truck stop coffee? Because I've had a lot of experience <laughs> drinking truck stop coffee recently. Honestly, I don't know how I did it, but this might be worse than truck stop coffee. It doesn't have the metallic taste, <laughs> but... It's definitely, it, it's on par with uh, a terrible gas station cup of coffee. That sounds disgusting. It's delightful. Maybe you should uh, buy some coffee or someone should buy you coffee. You know what? I like that second option a little bit better. And it works out because we're here today to tell our listeners about a new listener support service we're using called Buy Me a Coffee. And you can find us and buy us a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. And it's cool because there's a couple different ways that our listeners can get involved and support the show. Number one, you can just donate to the show by clicking buy them a coffee. Two, you can join as a member with levels starting at $5 per month. A few of the membership perks include monthly bonus episode titled History's B-Side Battles, in which we debate to see which B-Sider would come on top in a battle royale to the death. You also get access to our future episode queue, discounts on extras on our online shop, and history's B-side gifts and swag. And those extras, like you mentioned, include things like choosing topics for future episodes. You can buy custom postcard sets or stickers. And we even have some things like coffee mugs or some future merch that we're going to add on there as we go. And you obviously don't have to be a member to get those things. But if you are a member, you get a discount on them. And it's actually a much better deal 25 to 50% off what you would if you weren't a member. It's a great way for our listeners to support us in a more casual way and make sure that we're not recording while drinking terrible cups of coffee like the one I have in my hand right now. <laughs> the website again is buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. We so appreciate your support. It's what helps us continue to put these episodes on every single week and continue our research and make sure you're learning about all the cool people from history that we sometimes forget. With that said, let's get back to today's B-Sider. Hey everyone, before we continue with today's episode, just wanted to give a quick shout out to two of our newest members on our Buy Me A Coffee page, our good friend Jess Gonda and my aunt Sherry Hall. Thank you guys so much for supporting us on Buy Me A Coffee. It really means a lot to us and, you know, helps keep this podcast going. So if you are listening to this and you want to know more about our Buy Me A Coffee page, it's buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. There's a couple different membership levels that start at $5 a month. You get access to our monthly bonus episode, histories b-side battles, as well as some other benefits and perks that go along with each level. Thank you. You guys mean the world to us and we really appreciate it. Now, back to the episode. All right, welcome back. So we left off with a little bit of the early life of Rosalind Franklin and the beginnings to her scholastic career. And now we're going to get into the more important, influential parts of her career. So after World War II, Franklin began searching for a different type of work. A former colleague helped her get a position in Jacques Mering's lab at the Laboratoire Central des Services Chimiques de l'État in Paris. At the quote, nailed it. I did nail it. I tried. You know, <laughs> my my French gets exponentially better when we're talking about wine than chemistry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so at the labo, as it was known, 
She learned how to... An- it cannot be called No, that. that's what they call That's what the French called it. The Labo. Le beau. I'm sure that's how they pronounce that it. aggressively? Le <laughs> that's worse than laughogram. <laughs> it is worse than laughogram. That's true. <laughs> so at the Labo, as it was known... <laughs> She learned how to analyze carbons using X-ray crystallography, also called X-ray diffraction analysis, becoming very proficient with the technique. So for those who don't know, X-ray diffraction or X-ray crystallography basically involves taking molecular structures that are too small to see with the human eye and viewing them with X-rays and specifically by shooting X-rays into them and viewing the way x-rays diffract out of them. So if you think about the way, you know, ultraviolet or color light hits a crystal and then refracts or diffracts in a different way, or you've seen, like, the most simple way I can think about this is, like, the Pink Floyd album cover where light enters the crystal (laughs) and exits in a rainbow. That's the picture that was in my mind, and I was wondering if you were going to say it. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the picture that most people would choose. But this was a way of shooting x-rays into a structure, a molecular structure, and then measuring the way light diffracted, specifically x-ray light diffracted out of it. And this allowed people to get a picture of what these things looked like based on the diffraction angles of the different types of x-rays. So it was basically a way of photographing things that were too small to photograph in a very simple term. And her work detailing the structures of graphitizing and non-graphitizing carbons helped form the basis for the development of carbon fibers and new heat-resistant materials, and earned her an international reputation among coal chemists. So she really got her start among coal, which kind of harkens back to when I said earlier, coal was the main fuel of the day. It, It was like gasoline would be now. So today, Rosalind Franklin might have been a chemist for you know, ExxonMobil or BP or Hmm. a a major, a major gas company and helped to understand the way that fuel coal was burnt and how it reacted to being burnt and which types and styles were better for fuel. While she was in Paris, she enjoyed the collegial professional culture of the Laboratoire Central and formed many lifelong friendships there. Though very happy in France, Franklin began seeking a position in England in 1949. Her friend Charles Coulson, a theoretical chemist, suggested she look into doing X-ray diffraction studies of large biological molecules. In 1950, she was awarded a three-year Turner and Newall Fellowship to work in John T. Randall's biophysics unit at King's College London. Randall had originally planned to have Franklin build up a crystallography section and work on analyzing proteins. At the suggestion of the assistant lab chief, Maurice Wilkins, however, Randall asked Franklin to investigate DNA instead. Wilkins had just begun doing X-ray diffraction work on some unusually good DNA samples. Wilkins expected that he and Franklin would work together, but Randall's communication to Franklin did not convey this. It said that only she and graduate student Raymond Gosling would do the DNA work. It's worth mentioning that Raymond Gosling was formerly Wilkins' lab assistant. So there's an, I mean, it's clear why these people would have misunderstood each other as Maurice Wilkins and Gosling were working together. And then Franklin enters the scene. Randall, who is the head of the lab, in his mind, I think, thought, franklin and gosling would continue the work wilkins wasn't on that page at this point yet and this this misunderstanding kind of led to some friction between the two which we'll get to in a moment but so just to kind of understand the hierarchy of this lab um correct me if i'm explaining it wrong but randall is in charge of the whole thing right and wilkins is beginning to do this research and has gosling as his assistant Mm -hmm. Franklin is hired in under her inta- under her interpretation to be essentially Wilkins' partner, but he views her as like an assistant, so he thinks that she's under him, but they're supposed to be working together. That's mostly correct. I think a couple words could be changed. So Franklin was hired in with the understanding that she alone 
with the assistance of Gosling would be working on this DNA research. And that, I think, was Randall's intention. Randall didn't do a good job of letting Wilkins, who was the former superior to Gosling and researcher, he didn't, Randall didn't do a good job of letting Wilkins know that Franklin was coming in under the guise of taking over the research entirely. So okay. Wilkins, if you kind of put yourself in their position, Wilkins, I think, would have felt a bit slighted that this other person was brought in to finish this research that he'd started with Gosling. Franklin was told it was her and Gosling alone. So she probably had no idea why Wilkins would have the attitude he would have. And that led to okay. some personal friction between the two of them, which will become a little bit important later. And this continued. They, you know, this friction continued throughout their professional relationship. In fact, within six months of her arrival at King's in early 1951, the two were having very little to do with each other. However, working with Gosling, Franklin took increasingly clear X-ray diffraction photos of DNA molecules and quickly discovered that there were two forms, wet and dry, which produced very different pictures. The wet form, she realized, was probably helical in structure, with the phosphates on the outside of the ribose chains. Her mathematical analysis of the dry form diffractions, however, did not indicate a helical structure, and she spent over a year trying to resolve the differences. By early 1953, she had concluded that both forms had two helices, which is what we're used to today with the two sides of the helix twisting around one another. Oh, okay, so... I was going to say, I know you're not the, the chemist here, but is that still our interpretation of DNA that there's like a wet DNA and a dry DNA? Because I've never heard that before. Yeah. But you're saying that's the two helixes. She was viewing them separately? Yeah, so this requires a bit more explanation that I, I dove into. It was part of the technical piece that I attempted to leave out, but maybe should have done a better job of sifting through. So <laughs> when she refers to wet and dry, which I will... From here on, refer to the dry as crystalline, because that's the word that Franklin used. Okay. So she was able to do all of this work due to highly sensitive cameras that Wilkins had purchased and used previously. However, because of her work previously in physical chemistry, she was able to focus these cameras with by controlling the humidity inside the camera chamber. So... Humidity over, I think it was a a relative 75% humidity was considered wet. And then under that, drier conditions inside the camera chamber were considered dry. And based on those two conditions, the DNA molecule changed. In the drier environment, the, the DNA molecules stretched out and were long, thin. Um, and then in the more humid environment, the wet environment, as she called it, they became short and a little bit wider. So I can't speak too much to how this would have chemically changed the DNA, but in terms of being able to take a picture of it with x-rays, it certainly changed the format of those pictures. And that's really what we mean for the rest of the episode when we say wet and dry DNA. Okay. Now, while this is all going on, so Wilkins and Franklin and Gosling are all working on these DNA structures and taking photos of them and studying their structure. At the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge, Francis Crick and James Watson were working on a theoretical model of DNA. Though not in close communication with Franklin, in January of 1953, they gleaned crucial insights about DNA's structure from one of her X-ray diffraction photos, shown to them by Wilkins, and from a summary of her unpublished research submitted to the Medical Research Council. Watson and Crick never told Franklin that they had seen her materials, and they did not directly acknowledge their debt to her work when they published their announcement in Nature that April. Crick later admitted that Franklin was two steps away from realizing the correct structure in the spring of 1953. So they actually did know about her? This wasn't just a misunderstanding? I, I, th I think they did. I mean, when you consider if these people were like laborers... <laughs> I could understand that maybe they didn't get it, 
but they were scientific researchers of their day and, and at this time at the forefront of DNA research and should have known better. Um, the best way I can explain it quickly is that Watson and Crick were trying to formulate a model to show what DNA looked like. And their model, up till they found her research and her photos, was incorrect, technically. I mean, his, history shows that their model was incorrect. And then they found her photographs and her research, which was unpublished, and corrected it. And then they, as we'll discuss in a moment, republished with a different structure. So it's it's a bit fuzzy, but I think from any researcher's point of view, it was pretty clearly... I mean, they they saw her research, used it to basically prove their own hypothesis and never gave her credit. So one of her biggest hmm. issues, and it, this was stated by her and others, but one of her biggest issues was that she didn't like this theoretical model of DNA or of chemistry because it was a bit too unproven. She was very committed to data and very committed to experimental chemistry and physics and she wanted data and actual real-time evidence for her conclusions so she was a bit slower to say oh yes dna has a double helix because she wanted definitive data-based evidence to prove that whereas watson and crick as my reading seemed to confirm watson and crick were just building this model initially having three helixes or a triple helix that was incorrect, we're building this model based on a hypothesis that wasn't necessarily proven yet. And they used her research and her photographs to prove it without giving her the necessary credit, if hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. However, unfortunately, by the time of Watson and Crick's submission... Franklin had arranged to transfer her fellowship to J.D. Bernal's crystallography laboratory at Burbeck College, where she turned her attention from DNA to the structure of plant viruses, particularly tobacco mosaic virus, also known as TMV. Working with a team that included future novelist Aaron Klug, Franklin made meticulous X-ray diffraction photos of the virus. Her analysis of the diffraction patterns revealed, among other things, that TMV's genetic material, also known as RNA, was embedded in the inner wall of its protective protein shell. This work involved collaboration with many other virus researchers, particularly in the United States. Franklin made two lengthy visits there in 1954 and 1956 and established a network of contacts all over the country. Her expertise in virus structures was recognized by the Royal Institution in 1956, when its director honored her with a request to construct large-scale models of rod-shaped and spherical viruses for the 1958 Brussels World Fair Science Exhibition. However, in the fall of 1956, Franklin was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. For the next 18 months, she underwent surgeries and other treatments. She had several periods of remission during which she continued working in her lab and seeking funding for her research team. She had several periods of remission during which she continued working in her lab and seeking funding for her research team. Unfortunately, she died in London on April 16th, 1958. Oh, geez. She was so young. Yeah. She died very young. Like 37? 37 years old. She died very young. And a lot of people think that her... her younger death was a partial cause if not a partial cause a partial condition under which she was left out of you know her 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 due credit her due scientific credit right throughout her 16 year career franklin published steadily 19 articles on coals and carbons 5 on dna and 21 articles on viruses during her last few years, she received increasing numbers of invitations to speak at conferences all over the world, and it is likely that her virus work would have earned awards and other professional recognition had she lived to continue it. And this is a, I think, very common theme in her life is that had she lived longer, she would have gotten a lot more due credit for her work than she received having died at 37. 
But the question remains, why does one have to, you know, live longer than 37 to see credit for work done before the age of 37? Right. Yeah. Franklin's scientific achievements, both in coal chemistry and virus structure research, were considerable. Her peers in those fields acknowledged this during her life and after her death. However, it is her role in the discovery of DNA structure that has garnered the most public attention. And we mentioned Crick and Watson earlier, and we're going to return to their story here. Crick, Watson, and her colleague Wilkins shared the 1962 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine for their work on the structure of DNA. None of them gave Franklin credit for her contributions at that time. Franklin's work on DNA may have remained a quiet footnote in that story had Watson not caricatured her in his 1968 memoir, The Double Helix. There, he presented Franklin as, quote, Rosie, which was the character's name, a bad-tempered, arrogant blue stocking who jealously guarded her data from colleagues, even though she was not competent <laughs> to interpret it. His book proved very popular, even though many of those featured in the story, including Crick and Wilkins, protested Watson's treatment of Franklin, as did many reviewers. So was Rosie intended to be a pseudonym so that he like didn't actually mention her name? Or was that actually like a nickname for Rosalind? Like, did people call her Rosie? I don't think I mean, there was no indication that anybody ever called her Rosie. It was intended to be a pseudonym, I think. I guess it wouldn't be surprising that a lot of scientists at this time would be kind of arrogant and especially protective of their work. Like from what you read on Franklin, do you think that his portrayal of her was unfair or do you think she actually was sort of at least a little bit protective of the research that she was yeah. doing? I think it was unfair for sure. There were statements about her demeanor, which make me understand to a degree why one might have this interpretation about her i will preface this by saying i think that interpretation by watson is sexist <laughs> and <laughs> even at the time was sexist but certainly today would be considered that way but it was said that she had a very confident air about her and she had a knack or a i guess a tendency to make very direct unblinking eye contact when making her points and that came from her you know, hard work behind the scenes to make sure she was right when she was saying what she was saying. So when she was communicating with people like Wilkins or like Watson and Crick, she was very unforgiving in what she said. And she didn't blink. She didn't break eye contact, which would have been unusual, I think, for a woman at this time. She just, she just, I think, displayed the confidence typical of a man of her day. And I think that made her her male colleagues uncomfortable to a certain degree. Uh, especially Wilkins, who, despite, you know, protesting Watson's treatment of her, even Wilkins didn't like her because Wilkins was a much was known as a much shyer man who didn't make eye contact with people. In fact, he was known for, you know, hmm. looking at the ground when he would talk and kind of stuttering through sentences. So to have a woman such as Franklin, who researched until she was confident and then said things eye to eye without blinking and almost, I mean, it was said a couple times that she said these things as though they were obvious. It, it almost <laughs> appears like if you talk to her, she might have appeared arrogant and not to defend their treatment of her. But especially at this time, I think women today even see that in, in kind of care, not caricatured, but the, the made fun of phrase, be more polite, smile more, right? Don't be so bossy. I think right. strong women who know what they're saying and are confident even today are a bit out of place. And especially in her time, 70 years ago would have been, I think, treated a bit differently. So I don't think his portrayal was correct. I think it certainly was focused on every negative aspect you could pick out. But I will say, like, I think he wasn't, I will say he wasn't the only one. I think that felt that way. So did his book also comment on the fact that she was wearing pants in the lab instead of a dress? <laughs> I think if it, if it had had something to do with the science, he might've <laughs> nonetheless, 
1975, Franklin's friend Anne Sayre published a biography, an angry rebuttal to Watson's account, and Franklin's role in the discovery became better known. Numerous articles and several documentaries have attempted to highlight her part in the race for the double helix, often casting her as a feminist martyr, cheated of a Nobel Prize both by misogynistic colleagues and by her early death. Which is partially true. However, as her second biographer, Brenda Maddox, has noted, this too is a caricature and unfairly obscures both a brilliant scientific career and Franklin herself. So, I guess in looking back on what I've read and what I've heard about her, I think the feminist martyr viewpoint is maybe as opposite and skewed as Watson's viewpoint that she was this, you know, paranoid, protective, overconfident researcher, and that really she was just doing her work as a scientist. And that, I think, is Maddox's point, is that she was just a good researcher. She died early, but obviously never during her life was she angry or protective of her research. And I think it, if she were, if somehow she were able to be alive today, it would matter more to her that we knew about the double helix than that she got credit for it, despite the fact that she's probably due credit for some of it. I think we make that mistake a lot in how we present women of history. The fact that we try to make them seem like, you know, feminist martyrs instead of being notable for their own achievements. And I, I think we're guilty of that on our podcast too. I was thinking actually about when we talked about Susanna Salter, the first female mayor in America, who did nothing notable in her tenure as mayor of Argonia, Kansas, but she's notable in history because she was the first female to do that. Like, what's important about this story is that she's someone who was very smart and put in the research, and she, through her research, was notable, not because she was the, the feminine scientist. Right. You know what I mean? Like... If you had gone through this whole episode without mentioning her first name or anything, using her pronouns, she and her, anything like that, you just said Franklin did this, Franklin did that, you know, we might not even know that it was a woman making these achievements, but it's her research and her background and her impressive resume, like you talked about, that is what makes her an important part of history. Right. Well, and that's a good point to bring up. In fact, one of the articles that I use to find information about her the main point of the article was, and the headline of the article was, Rosalind Franklin should not be called the wronged heroine of DNA for that very point. Let's stop talking about how she was a wronged heroine because that almost at this point is a overdone cliche trope in history, right? Like the mm-hmm. wronged heroine of blah, blah, blah. And maybe we we probably are guilty of this as the subject of our podcast might lead to in that we are looking for, you know, necessarily wronged people or background people that weren't given as much credit as they might have been due. But it's interesting that you bring that up, given that there was a specific article written with that main point. Well, it's fair to say that a lot of, you know, women and minorities have been forgotten by history because of their gender. This may be a case of that although it's probably not the full story to focus on the fact that it was just a female scientist it she was a very respectable scientist in her own right but she kind of got overwritten because of people taking basically her research without credit and she died young where she couldn't have received all the accolades that she might have been doing i guess on that note it's pretty noted that the nobel committee doesn't make posthumous nominations do you think that Franklin would have won a Nobel Prize if she hadn't died young? I don't know. For the research on DNA, I think it's unlikely because it was given to the others who didn't give her due credit. I think she might have won a Nobel Prize based on her research on viruses. She did a lot of work, like I said, with the tobacco virus, TMV, and started to do work on polio. And I mean, she was 37. At that time, she probably had another... 30 some years on average to live and to work. So I think it's very likely that she might have uncovered something about viruses in this new direction she was taking that would have led her to a Nobel Peace Prize. I don't know that she would have won one 
for her work on the DNA double helix. This is purely opinion, but do you think she deserved to win one just in the amount of research that she did? Because Watson and Crick and Wilkins received one for the same research, yes. Because she was a part of that research. She was an integral part of it. They were wrong until they looked at her research and discovered what how she had reconciled you know photographs that seem to indicate one thing with the true reality that they are a double helix and they didn't indicate that in their research so i think yes i i do believe if watson crick and wilkins are are you know deserving of the nobel peace prize for their work in dna i think she is too because they used her work that happens to be unpublished and unspoken for i agree with you i mean you did the research not me but yeah. i i think that makes sense now i mean that's not to say like any scientific hypothesis that's proven true necessarily has to give credit to the one that came before it i think you have to give credit but i don't know that the award would be due because there were lots of researchers that built up the knowledge in order for watson and crick to come up with their model but I think the necessary distinction is that their model was wrong <laughs> until they discovered her research and corrected it. Whereas like they weren't just building on previously accepted known scientific evidence. They actively changed their hypothesis based on her research and then won the Nobel prize. So yes, I think for that work, she certainly does deserve it. All right. Well, chemistry major, you ready for a little <laughs> quiz? I wish I was a chemistry major. I'd probably make more money these days. But yes, sure, I'm ready for my quiz. <laughs> All right. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Who's ready for a chemistry pop quiz? Chemistry pop quiz sounds like my worst nightmare. <laughs> As you may know, we like to end every episode with just a short three-question quiz to kind of test today's host, see how much he studied in and around his topic, and maybe you, the listener at home, know some of these, have heard of some of these, and you can answer along by yelling at your phone, computer, headphones, tablet, however you're listening to this lovely podcast. Maybe you know, maybe you don't. Are you ready? I am ready. No reason to be nervous. Only one of them is actually about chemistry. The other two are more about Rosalind Franklin. All right. All right, for your first question, and this is one that I, I think you will get this, as long as you hmm. read a little bit beyond what you actually presented in the episode. So you, you talked a little bit about her work with viruses towards the end of her life. In, yeah. In 1956, shortly before her death, Franklin applied for and was awarded a grant from the U.S. Public mm. Health Service and the National Institutes of Health to research a live version of what virus? I would say polio. Polio is correct. She unfortunately died before the research was complete, but a colleague that you actually mentioned earlier, Aaron Klug, stepped in to fill her role on the research team. Hmm. I thought it was interesting because I, I found an inscription on her tombstone that actually references her research on viruses, but much yeah. like her reason for being a B-sider, doesn't say anything about her work on DNA. Right. Question number two. There is a 2003 documentary and a 2011 stage play which both centered around Rosalind Franklin and her contributions to science. Both of these productions are named after the specific x-ray diffraction image which Wilkins had shown to Watson to help them develop their DNA model. What was the name of this image? Oh god. It was A DNA is the type of DNA it was in, like the image was of, I don't know though, the name of the image. <laughs> this is a tough one, but the image was called Photo 51. 
simply because it was the 51st uh-huh. diffraction photograph that Franklin and Gosling had taken. Uh, this specific one was the one that was critical in identifying the structure of DNA. So the documentary is called DNA Secret of Photo 51, and then the stage play is called simply Photograph 51. Yeah. Dang. <laughs> All right, and your final question, which is the chemistry question, and I think you're going to nail it. I tried to make it as easy as I could, but it was the first question I thought of when you said we were doing a DNA episode. So DNA is composed of four types of smaller chemical molecules called nucleotide bases. They are abbreviated with the initials A, C, G, and T. Can you name these four nucleotide bases? Oh, that's rude. I was gonna. <laughs> I, I was hoping you were gonna ask what the n- abbreviations were because I could have named those. <laughs> well, here's your hint. They each start with one of those letters, and oh, they great. each end in I N E. I, I have no idea. <laughs> glutamine. Glutamine is my guess for G. No. All right. <laughs> Any other yep, guesses? I got nothing. No, I, that, was, that was my closest one that I felt like it was solid. <laughs> All right. So the A is adenine. The C is cytosine. This G is guanine. Mm. And the T is thymine. Thymine. I probably mispronounced those too. I'm sure I have chemistry friends that would they listen to this would be like screaming, but it's fine. <laughs> Honestly, I admitted if, that this wasn't my subject. <laughs> if roles were reversed, there's no way I would have got that. I would have struggled to get the four abbreviations. I think I would have got three of the four, but one of them I definitely would have missed. I had to look that up, but it was the first thing that popped in my head was like, I remember doing the, what is it? DNA sequencing that we had to do in high school chemistry class. And I was yeah. like, that's, memorable to me but i could not tell you the name of four names of them without looking it up if you would ask me the other one i would have gotten a t and c i forgot about g that's when you guessed like you had a guess for that one it's the only one i had i don't know it's the only one i had any sort of idea (laughs) beyond just random syllables well that wasn't too difficult you got at least one of them right yeah i'll take it (laughs) I tried to not get too chemistry intensive on you. Yeah. As always, we really appreciate your support. Uh, We appreciate our listeners for tuning in and seeing what we have to say each week about our topics and being interested in history as we are. If you have any comments, questions, suggestions, or otherwise, please feel free to reach out to us at historiesbside at gmail.com or Hit us or up if on you want to correct media. our knowledge of science and yeah, please do. We know we're not. We know we're not uh, the pinnacles of all academic research. So please hit us up with corrections if you find them. <laughs> but like, don't be mean about it. We know yeah, we be, got it wrong. Be kind. Be kind about it. We're kind. Please <laughs> be kind. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd love to hear from you. Uh, either at historiesbside at gmail.com or on social media. And if not, we hope to speak to you next week on our next episode. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Histories B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service and follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Histories B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can donate to the show at buymeacoffee.com slash historiesbside. While you're there, check out our membership perks, merchandise, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to Histories B-Side.